Hey, how's it going guys? It's Nate here. And the Commonwealth of Fallout 4 is a far cry from the relatively safe and comfortable world that we all know today. Society has broken down and turmoil has built up in this mutant-infested, radiation-sprinkled wasteland. Lucky for us, Fallout 4 is also a game that features hundreds upon hundreds of various weapons to keep us safe in this brave new world. Big and small, ballistic and melee, nuclear and laser powered. You shouldn't have any trouble at all finding an instrument of destruction that suits your fancy. Alas, while many of these arms are fairly common and not too difficult to acquire, there are some objects in the game that are especially rare or particularly unique that you won't find very many of at all. And these items are certainly some of Fallout's most fascinating, as they often boast interesting backstories, fun ties to certain easter eggs, or are just super powerful. So today we'll be taking a look at 5 more secret and unique items in Fallout 4. Starting off, we have a weapon that's sure to bring the heat, if you will. Just south of Hub City Auto Wreckers, right on the banks of the Boston River, lies the Vitali Pump House, a small, unmarked location. Inside, there will be two rooms, both covered in a flammable liquid and separated by an inoperable door. The only way to get it to open will be by entering the right code on a nearby console. What's the code, you may ask? Well, it's written in big white numbers on the structure's east wall. 0451. Inside this locked room isn't a whole lot, except a bloodied skeleton and a unique 44 Magnum right next to it. The Gainer. Now, this is a special puppy for a whole lot of reasons. For one, it boasts a unique effect that causes it to burn targets for 15 points of damage with every shot, and causes the item's projectiles to erupt in a neat flame animation whenever they make contact with a character or object. The only other weapon in the game with a similar ability would be the Ashmaker, which we covered in a previous video. The gainer also comes with the Reflex Sight, Comfort Grip, and Bull Barrel modifications, which can be played around with at your leisure. The base 44 is already a pretty powerful hand cannon, oftentimes capable of one-shotting the right foes, provided you've leveled up the proper perks. But the incendiary ammunition it fires really takes the thing over the edge in both damage and enjoyability. Something else you may find very interesting about this object, and the place we find it in, is that it's actually a bit of a nod to Fahrenheit 451, a dystopian novel by Ray Bradbury where burning things, particularly books, is a major theme. Hence the reason the code we need to access the gainer is 0451, and why there's flammable oil all over the Vitali pump house as well. Furthermore, Joel Burgess, a lead level designer at Bethesda Game Studios, who's apparently responsible for implementing the gainer pistol and the location it's in, described the revolver as a bit of an easter egg within an easter egg on Twitter as not only does it pay homage to Fahrenheit 451, but he named the hand cannon after a fellow game developer friend of his, named Steve Gaynor, who evidently previously proclaimed his love for video game magnums. So not only is the Gaynor a blast to use, but it's also got a pretty hot background too. I'm sorry. Next on our list, I absolutely have to talk about one of the weirdest and certainly most unique, yet also classic, heavy weapons ever featured in a Fallout game. Yes, how could we forget the Junk Jet? Only two of these objects can ever be obtained in a single playthrough. One will always spawn in at the Arc Jet Systems Laboratory, just northwest of the Boston River, and another can be looted off of Manta Man, a hilarious NPC we can meet in a very rare random encounter, who believes himself to be the physical incarnation of a pre-war comic book superhero of the same name. Due to the really weird mechanics of the junk jet, which we'll get into in a second, it's actually unusable by NPCs. So Manta Man will only fight players with his fists, despite having the jet in his inventory. But now that we've talked about how you can get it, again just by looting it from Arcjet or murdering Manta Man to death, let's take a deeper dive into this hysterical beast of a cannon. The jet boasts a clearly one-of-a-kind model and texture, made of a variety of strange, rusty steel components hastily assembled together, and when equipped, 
let's just say it doesn't handle quite like anything else in the game. Upon trying to load the item with ammunition, you'll be prompted with a unique menu, where you can choose a number of miscellaneous junk items to put into the object's chamber. The junk jet doesn't fire regular ammunition. Instead, it shoots out whatever junk the player decides to load into it. Furthermore, because of this, it has a theoretically infinite magazine capacity. It will continue to fire whatever junk item you tell it to, without reloading, until you're all out. So if you've got, I don't know, say 1000 aluminum cans in your inventory, revel and joy, because you won't need to reload until you've lost all 1000 of them. Most of the projectiles you fire can also be retrieved and used again, with only about 15% being lost due to either despawning or getting stuck in something, further adding clout to the jet sway with ammo-cautious players. No matter what you choose to load into it, the jet will deal about 40 points of base damage, but each shot can be charged by simply holding down the trigger for up to one second. This will increase its potential damage output by another 30 points, allowing it to deal 70 points of damage, and that's all without any perks or stat buffs. The jet also has its own custom family of modifications you can add to it, allowing players to extend its barrel, put on some sights, or even allow it to dish out fire and electric damage. In all seriousness, this can be quite the beast at close ranges with the right stats and customization. Where the junk jet tends to become, well, junk though, is at medium to long ranges. Its shots have a terrible tendency to arc and drop off at any distances beyond what you would expect with a normal pistol. Don't forget about flight time either. It takes considerably longer for one of the junk jet's projectiles to make contact with an enemy target than it does any normal ballistic weapon. So this item just generally being horrendously inaccurate, coupled with a low rate of fire, makes it not ideal for anything but the closest kinds of engagement. The junk jet is really supposed to represent Fallout 4's sillier side. It's not supposed to be realistic, heck, it's not even supposed to be practical. It's just supposed to be something fun to use, and that it very much is. Players of Fallout 3 will recall this item's spiritual predecessor, the Rock It Launcher, that operated in a similar adorable way. I guess at the end of the day, even in the world of Fallout, the old proverb holds true. One man's trash is another man's ammunition. Coming in at number three, this one's special. We have an object that's literally impossible to obtain without the use of mods or simple console commands on the PC. The animatronic Alien Blaster. This is a unique type of laser pistol introduced with the Nuka World DLC that we players are never given the opportunity to acquire. It's used by the animatronic alien foes which populate the galactic zone of the amusement park, and it bears a striking resemblance to the alien blaster we could acquire off of a UFO in Fallout 3. Now, again, sadly we can never loot one of these devices off of defeated enemies. However, funnily enough, if we equip one through the console, we can discover that the animatronic alien blaster does indeed have proper first-person animations, and even a reloading animation, implying that Bethesda did go through all of the work necessary to make this item a usable one, and then just didn't. In the base game, we do of course have access to another type of alien blaster we can take off of a wounded alien following a spaceship crash. It has pretty much identical stats and an identical clip size, dealing 50 points of energy damage with 42 rounds a clip. Pretty nice. However, the unobtainable Alien Blaster enjoys a radically different model and texture. And interestingly, while it uses a unique type of ammunition called Alien Blaster Rounds, the animatronic version uses fusion cells. Furthermore, I should point out that despite being unobtainable, not only does the animatronic have that whole suite of animations I mentioned, but it can also be brought to a workbench, where a whole host of mods can be added to it. All of the appliable modifications are the same ones we can add to the regular Alien Blaster, and they even yield the same appearance. But it only goes to show that Bethesda really did do all of the work necessary to make it a usable item for the player. 
It's a shame this item never made the final cut of the game. Maybe Todd was wrong. Maybe some things don't always just work, after all. For fourth spot, this tenacious 10mm was definitely the most recommended item in our last video of the series. So, how could we ignore the Deliverer? A unique sidearm with a totally custom mesh and texture. Now, unlike other weapons featured in this video, the Deliverer is in fact obtained via quest, which makes its inclusion here kind of cheating, but when has that stopped us before? During the railroad quest, Tradecraft, where the player and Deacon inspect the remains of a recently attacked underground railroad base, Deacon will notice the Deliverer lying on the corpse of an agent. He'll point it out, saying it was custom made by Tinker Tom for that fallen soldier, before offering it up to the sole survivor. Simply walk up to the thing, pick it up, and she's all yours. Dealing 25 points of damage a shot, well better than most sidearms, Honestly, the pistol's nothing crazy. It does come with a suppressor modification, which greatly improves her recoil management and greatly reduces the range in which enemies will hear it go off, and can therefore be alerted to your presence when firing. However, it also reduces the item's actual range and makes it far weaker at a distance. Personally, my own recommendation would be that you take it to a workbench and remove the suppressor, preferably swapping it for an extended barrel, which, yes, is something you can do. I actually had always assumed that the suppressor couldn't be taken off until it was pointed out to me in the comment section of that last video, and it's a pretty cool result you get. You can make it look like a totally different device with the right modifications. Removing that suppressor will enable the deliverer to pack a much bigger punch, particularly at distances, so long as you can tolerate the cost to your stealth. That said, I can still understand not wanting to give the suppressor up. It sort of feels like an integral part of this item, and makes you feel like James Bond or something. Do whatever you please, it's your sidearm. Just make sure not to get any Raider remains all over your freshly pressed suit. Before we get to our final spot, there is one honorable mention I would like to discuss. The Cryolator. The reason I make this an honorable mention is because... Well, let's be honest, we have all seen this bad boy before, but I still really wanted to feature it in this video regardless. It's a unique weapon we can first encounter behind a lockbox in the Overseer's quarters of Vault 111. When we find it for the first time, we shouldn't be able to access it. It will require a lockpicking skill that we just won't possess. Now, there may or may not be a few exploits you can engage in to get it a bit early, but I digress. What Bethesda clearly actually wants us to do is come back after we've ranked up our lockpicking skill quite a bit. And boy oh boy, is doing so worth it. Basically, the Cryolator is a flamer that shoots ice and is far more powerful. It creates a cryogenic spray that bombards enemies with a massive area of effect and does 20 points of damage. By contrast, flamers, which do the same thing but with a fire spray, only do 12 points of damage. Of course, there's also a whole selection of different modifications that you can apply to the Cryolator. Each will do different things, but a very interesting one is the Crystallizing Barrel. This will convert it from a spraying device into an automatic shooter. It makes the Cryolator far more ammo efficient, and also increases the range, increases the damage, as crystals will now do ballistic and energy damage, and it also makes it fairly easier to handle. Though, that said, I will admit, if you're going for an automatic shooter, some heavily modded out laser pistols or rifles may be a bit of a better bet. Though, let's be honest, they're not nearly as fun. The Cryolator does also have some interesting lore behind it we can read about on the Overseer's Vault 111 terminal. You see, after the bombs fell and everybody in Vault 111 was sealed away in cryopods, there still needed to be a staff inside of alive humans to make sure everything was going okay. And there still was an Overseer. This Overseer got incredibly bored. So, as a way to occupy his time, he decided to develop this puppy. Using a variety of components and chemicals that were already available in the vault thanks to its cryopod experiment, it wasn't that difficult for him to create this item's prototype. Alas, eventually the staff of Vault 111 grew to hate each other, and they all murdered each other to death. So nobody was able to access this thing. Until you came around. So, what are we waiting for? It's time to take the Commonwealth by storm. And finally, last on our list, 
There's one more makeshift heavy weapon, somewhat similar to the junk jet in its aesthetic that I'd like to show off. The Railway Rifle. So, while pretty rare, there are a couple of opportunities you should get to obtain this fascinating device. The first is at Big John Salvage, south of Quincy, specifically in a small hidden bunker beneath a train cart that we can gain access to after flipping the appropriate switch and disabling its locking mechanism. The second location it spawns in is at Bedford Station, within a blue train carriage towards the southern outskirts of the station. Notably, it only spawns in here if you're level 20 or higher, so do bear that in mind. Furthermore, the Railway Rifle can also be pickpocketed off of Desdemona during the railroad quest Tactical Thinking, or found on Tinker Tom during Underground Undercover. So, assuming you join the railroad, you should get about four chances to obtain this puppy, or two if you decide not to. Nonetheless, I think the Railway Rifle is absolutely a worthy addition to any arsenal for reasons I can hopefully make obvious. Dealing a whopping 100 points of base damage without any perks or mods, you're going to be dishing out one-hit kills like nobody's business. For context, this is higher than pretty much any other non-gods rifle in the entire game, and its incredible accuracy is also definitely something to write home about. Unlike the junk jet, or other makeshift weapons, the railway rifle's rounds have almost no drop-off and wherever you aim is almost always where you're actually going to hit, largely irrespective of distance. Great accuracy and assortment of barrel mods and scopes and high power makes it a shockingly viable sniper, but that's far from where this item's utility ends. Its fire rate is decent enough that it handles itself fairly in close range combat, and even when you don't one-shot with it, the railway rifle pretty much will always stagger enemies, buying you a precious second or two before your foe can retaliate. Eccentric Soul Survivors can also consider adding an automatic receiver to the item, making it fully automatic, which has some amusing implications. But I wouldn't recommend that, as a railway rifle uses a special kind of ammo called Railway Spikes, which are rather rare and can't be crafted. They can be bought from certain merchants, but you really don't want to waste them. The rifle's design is clearly meant to remind us of locomotives. Steam emits from its chambers, and when you reload the thing, it even chews at you, which is adorable. Fallout 3 featured a railway rifle of its own. However, it was by far and away a much weaker version than its current variant, and it didn't even chew at you. So back then, there wasn't much of a reason to pay it any attention. But I'm pleased to report that in Fallout 4, it is absolutely an item worthy of your consideration. And with that, we are going to wrap up. Five more secret or otherwise unique items you may have missed in Fallout 4 Part 3. At least, I think it's part three. Oh, well, we'll figure that out later. Anyway, thanks for stopping by, everybody. Which of these instruments of offense and defense suited your fancy the most? And which ones did I miss? Leave a comment down below. As always, like ratings are very much appreciated, and I hope to catch you all in my next video. Peace out, everyone.